Welcome everyone to day three of the week of learning. So we've already had the first day on connection, second day on telling your story. And so today our topic is managing your mental health. And so we are excited to have Dr. Chloe Carmichael with us today to talk to us about how to handle your role as a student entrepreneur. So Dr. Chloe is a licensed clinical psychologist that practices in New York City in the U.S., serving high-functioning business executives, people in the arts, and everyday people seeking support with their personal and professional goals. Hi, I'm Dr. Chloe Carmichael, clinical psychologist and author of Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety. Thanks so much, Catherine. It's great to be with you, all of you. Um, As an entrepreneur myself, I just want you to know that I have so much respect and excitement for the things that you're doing. And it's really an honor to be able to just be here with you on your journey. How entrepreneurs can turn their anxiety into a superpower. Anxiety can feel overwhelming, right? I know that it's kind of an obvious truth. For some people that might feel like you're between a rock and a hard place. For other people, or even at different times, it might feel like you are on a bit of a tightrope. Other times you might just feel absolutely frozen, right? We all know about that fight, flight, or freeze reaction that many of us can have to challenging situations. But what I want you to know is that there's actually a very healthy function to anxiety. That hidden treasure is to stimulate preparation behaviors, right? And so I can tell you from my experience working with people that a lot of them are anxious. And sometimes they would come to me saying, you know, Dr. Chloe, how do I get rid of my anxiety? But then they would also, I could tell, have almost a little bit of a secret attachment to their anxiety because they also had a little bit of an awareness that somehow their anxiety was giving them this extra edge. And they didn't really want to just get totally laid back, right? That that wouldn't necessarily be the goal either. We don't actually want to get rid of your anxiety. We actually instead want to learn how to harness that anxiety. And when we harness the anxiety, It can actually help us to meet the goals that we need to meet. And now I want to go ahead and talk about you, right? So I know that all of you are driven, budding entrepreneurs. And you don't just find yourself at the EO Entrepreneurial Week like you are here unless you have a certain amount of drive, a certain amount of desire. It's trying to pull ahead of the competition. I know that there's room for many winners, you know, in life. But one thing I think that many entrepreneurs have in common is a desire for excellence, is a desire to look around at what everybody else is doing and say, hey, how can I innovate that? How can I disrupt that? How can I do it better, faster? All the different ways that entrepreneurs figure out to bring something new into the world and to make it a better place. We're risk takers. We're not necessarily content to just stand still. You know, we're getting out of our comfort zone almost by definition. And I just want to normalize that, of course, with that can come some anxiety. What we want to do is really learn how to channel that anxiety effectively. Because as we also know, there are definitely ups and downs, right? So our line of work can have big ups and big downs, right? We can have one day where we feel like we're on top of the world. And then the next day where it just feels like the wheels are falling off. And when things really matter to us, when we feel very passionate about our goals and we're invested in them, that's when those highs and lows can start to really affect us. Entrepreneurs like to take care of people, whether we're taking care of our teams, whether we are taking care of our customers, whether we are oftentimes even trying to take care of our families. We're building a business oftentimes to to support our families. And when we really have that level of investment, it often can feel like the stakes are high. 
And that's a wonderful thing. It creates a lot of excitement and engagement. But at the same time, again, it really necessitates that we understand how to manage that energy so that we are managing the energy rather than the energy managing us. So my book has nine techniques in order to do just that, how to take that anxiety and reframe it as nervous energy and harness it for power. The book has nine techniques. They're all kind of optional, meaning like do the ones that work for you, except for the first one, which is a mindfulness technique. The reason for that is because Mindfulness helps us to really observe ourselves so that we can know which of the other eight techniques, if any, would even necessarily be appropriate. A lot of people tend to have a one size fits all approach to anxiety where they say, oh, well, when you get anxiety, you should just take a deep breath and, you know, breathe it away or, you know, just learn to relax, right? Other people might say, well, hey, when you have anxiety, you just have to go, go, go and say no fear and I'm going to lean in, right? And those are all good things, but we have to first know which type of approach is going to be the best one for our particular situation. And so the first step is mindfulness because there are times when we need to lean into our anxiety And there are times when we need to learn how to pivot away from it. When people learn mindfulness skills, their anxiety and their stress go down and simultaneously their ability to communicate with others goes up. In fact, there's even appears to be a relationship between that, as I'm sure you can imagine. The better you know yourself and you can describe what's going on with you to others, which is what mindfulness helps you to do if you do it properly. Of course, the better your relationships go, both in business and in your personal life. So I like to think of mindfulness as metacognition. It's basically thinking about your thoughts. So you have this overall roadmap of where you are in any given moment, you know, throughout your day, right? So Suppose that you're at a meeting and you suddenly start to realize that you're going into a major people-pleasing mode. Awareness of that fact could be very helpful for you as you start to have a roadmap of where your thoughts seem to be taking you. Or maybe you have an awareness that you're having, you know, insecurities about if you belong at that meeting. Having that overall awareness of the thoughts that we have in our mind gives us a lot of power in terms of how we can self-soothe if that's what we need to do or redirect ourselves onto a different mental pathway if that's what we need to do. But the first step before we do anything is always to have a very sharp overview of what exactly is going on in the first place. We can oftentimes actually have so much going on in our heads that it can sometimes take us by surprise to to realize that we might be a little bit overloaded or that we might be overwhelmed, whatever the case may be. So doing mindfulness exercises helps to sharpen our awareness of what's going on inside of our own head, which, um, you know, again, believe it or not, is actually the pathway to mental health. So mindfulness, as I was saying, does help us to choose the best tools to make sure that we are choosing a relaxation technique when it's appropriate to relax rather than just always relaxing. So suppose that you have a big meeting, a big investor meeting, and you're nervous about it. Is that necessarily the time to just do deep breaths and relax? Or is maybe that the time to take that anxiety and try to channel it into improving your presentation or researching a little bit of background about who these investors are so that you can connect with them as effectively as possible, right? So those would be times when you would say, oh, well, maybe it's actually not the right time to just relax. It's the time to do a leaning in technique. Now, let's say it's after the meeting, you've done your you know, due diligence of reviewing the meeting and learned everything and done all your follow-up that you can do, but you just keep replaying that meeting in your head and you're realizing it's a waste of energy at that point, right? At that time might be some good relaxation or mentally pivoting away techniques. 
I just wanted to frame for you the reason why we start with mindfulness so that we can make sure that we're really gauging and evaluating the situation correctly to make sure that we reach for the right tool. Another benefit of it is that once we learn how to know ourselves and to communicate well with others, we can navigate some of life's tough moments as entrepreneurs. The way that we get into mindfulness is actually through breathing. I was a yoga teacher before I was a psychologist. And the thing about mindfulness that's interesting because psychology has also gotten completely obsessed with mindfulness as well now because it has been proven to be such an effective stress reducer and communication improver for people is that in traditional Buddhist mindfulness, we start by observing and describing an object. And that starts to show you that power of words. Once people get good at describing objects, they graduate to describing a semi-tangible object, which is their breath. And once they get good at describing their breath, then they graduate to being able to describe abstract objects like thoughts and feelings. We're doing this in the context of those three levels of mindfulness that I just described. So the exercise is really not just breathing, it's also priming you to be able to observe and describe what's happening inside for you. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and start with the three-part breath, which is a mindfulness exercise. And then I'm going to go ahead and give you thumbnails of the rest of the techniques in the book that are more practical around leaning in with anxiety or mentally redirecting yourself. But again, the first thing we need to do is learn how to observe and describe ourselves. The three-part breath before we start, I'm just going to share with you, you know, what the three parts of it are. The first part is the belly. So if you put your hand on your belly and you take a breath inward, you'll feel your stomach kind of ballooning outward. That's, that's the first part. The second part of the three-part breath is on the outer edge of your rib cage. So for women, kind of like where the sides of your bra would go. And if you take a breath in, you can feel your rib cage expanding horizontally. The third place in the three-part breath is the upper chest. So if you put your hand on your upper chest and you take a breath inward, you feel your hand rising vertically right there. So that's one belly, two middle chest, and three upper chest rising. When we do it together, we're going to do that all in one seamless inhalation. So we'll be inhaling the belly, same inhalation, continuing the middle chest, and then finally filling with air all the way up to the top. Then we'll be holding for a moment and exhaling in reverse order, upper chest, middle chest, and then the belly emptying completely. I'd like to go ahead and get started, remembering again that the real purpose here is learning how to notice and observe yourself in a non-judgmental way. So go ahead and take your hands, put them in your lap with your palms facing up and take your physical gaze to your hands, which is just a way of saying, look at your hands. So you're already behaviorally starting to look at yourself, to direct your attention towards yourself. Now, before you do anything at all to change your breath, I'd like you to just notice your breath, just silently observing five facts about your breath. Do you feel like you're breathing deeply or shallowly? Maybe you notice the way that your clothing moves with each breath in and out. Maybe you notice the air feels dry or humid or cool. Whatever it is, just noticing five things about your breath, but also about yourself as you go about this exercise, if you notice that you're feeling excited to take a few moments of break in your day, or if you're even feeling anxious, like, hey, can we get to the information? You know, I'm just sitting here breathing. Whatever it is, just noticing yourself in this moment. And now I'd like you to go ahead and exhale to prepare. And inhaling one, letting the belly balloon with air two, the middle chest widening, and three, the upper chest rising vertically, holding for a moment there at the top of the inhale, and then exhaling just the upper chest, two, the middle chest shrinks, 
And three, letting the belly empty completely, maybe even taking navel back to spine to really push the air out. And then inhaling, letting the belly balloon with air. Two, the middle chest widening. And three, the upper chest rising vertically. Holding a moment there, noticing what it feels like to have that big breath of air. Seeing if you can even relax your shoulders without exhaling. And then exhaling just your upper chest. And two, locating that middle chest and exhaling there, feeling the ribs pull away from your clothing. And then three, belly empties completely. Now, keeping your gaze on your hands, allow your breath to simply return to normal without you doing anything to control it. And once again, I'd like you to now notice five things about your breath. One of the ways that we can sharpen our skills of self-observation is by giving ourselves two different situations where we observe the same thing. And that tends to help us to understand what's different from moment to moment. So noticing, do you feel like your breath is deeper now or just anything about your body that feels different or anything even about your mind that feels different, but simply practicing to make five observations about yourself in this moment. Now, I'd like you to let your gaze come back up, kind of come back to the room here with me. And this is the time when we practice putting our observations into words, or you can just go ahead and write them down. Because again, it's such an interesting thing, I have to say, as a clinical psychologist, as a former yoga teacher, as well as an entrepreneur, It is so amazing that when we practice observing simple things like our breath, we are actually so much better able to communicate what's going on with ourselves when the stakes are high and we're having to communicate more complex things. Maybe we're having to communicate to an employee, hey, you know, I I really appreciate your enthusiasm, but I need you to learn how to listen a little bit more to others during meetings or whatever it is, whatever observations or things you're noticing on the fly, you'll be so much better able to communicate them, which certainly helps mental health and team cohesiveness. You'll be much better able to communicate them the more that you build up those mindfulness skills. It is really important to practice, just like we don't want to say, practice at the game. We've probably all heard that phrase before. Uh, Professional ball players, they say we don't practice at the game. We sit there throwing free throws or doing kicks over and over in a low stake situation so that when the stakes are high and it really counts, we just almost go into autopilot and do that. I would encourage you to practice and you can practice with me for free on video at drchloe.com slash breathe. That's D-R-C-H-L-O-E.com slash breathe. Um, I go through that exercise and a couple of others as well. Now, what do we do with that insight, right? Once we've really been able to observe ourselves and get a good handle on exactly what this anxiety is about, and we've really been able to determine, okay, this anxiety is stimulating me to prepare, or I have a pretty good evaluation that this anxiety is just plain old overdrive and that what I really need to do is to turn it down a notch. Once we have that insight, then we can go ahead and start using some more specific techniques to control and use that anxiety to be helpful to us, right? So it's not just something we're even trying to manage. It's actually something that we are getting to use like an effective tool, an arrow in our quiver. So as I mentioned, there are a total of nine techniques in the book. We just did the first one, which is the three-part breath. So the worry time technique is a good one for people who, you know, kind of call themselves a little bit of a worry wart. You know, maybe their mind is always going and they're thinking, oh, what if this? Oh, what if that? Oh, have I thought of this? Oh, have I thought of that? Right? And such people, in my experience, sometimes can actually get kind of down on themselves for doing this. They can say, oh, my mind is always going, oh, I can never just relax and be in the moment. And what they're doing is they're actually overlooking that there's a very valuable 
component of what their mind is doing, that they have an active mind that is future oriented, that's thinking proactively about things. It's just that that energy needs to be shaped a little bit. So what we do with worry time is we create um, a time in our calendar where we actually, when we're having those thoughts pop into our head, we deposit them into the notes and details of that calendar event. And then at the appropriate time and place, we focus on those events and we really think about them. And what this does is it frees our brain in the, in the moment when it's having kind of those popcorn ideas of I should be doing this or I should be doing that. If we don't write it down, our brain actually feels like it needs to keep that concern in our working memory. It's afraid to let go of it. So when we write it down or put it somewhere for consideration, it actually lets us relax a little bit more about it. Plus, it creates the appropriate time and space when we can really give that concern our undivided attention that it really deserves instead of just trying to kind of think about it in the back of our head while we're actually really in the middle of doing something else. The zone of control is another technique that I personally really enjoy and I've benefited a lot from this one myself. What we do with the zone of control is we take something that maybe feels just a little bit overwhelming. Like say, for example, I need to increase sales, right? What entrepreneur on some level hasn't had some version of that thought, like I need to increase sales. And what we do then is we break that big, broad description down into smaller components of things that we can control and things that we cannot control, right? So things we can control, we might be able to say, okay, well, have I done an analysis of my website traffic to understand exactly where people are falling off in my sales process? Or have I done some pricing tests to understand if there's something about a change in my pricing that could really help? Or, you know, have I talked to all of my mentors that could help me to, to think about this? Or should I maybe think about attending some conferences or networking events where I could raise awareness, right? So we just start thinking about all those things that we maybe could potentially control. In the process, we might also be noticing that there could be things we just simply cannot control, right? Like, is there really a demand, you know, for this product? Or do I have competitors that I just can't really beat the competition? We just kind of do a big list of all the potential factors in our lives that could pertain to this goal of increasing sales. And then we divide it up into things we can control and things we cannot control. And then what we do is by the things we can control, we write down verbs, action words of things that we can do to control those factors. Finally, then, once we have that zone of control chart made for ourselves, all we have to do then is when we get that kind of restless feeling of anxiety about sales, we don't have to just stew with that energy or let that energy just kind of run wild, unshaped. What we do then is we just point our eyeballs and maybe you know point our finger at our pre-made list of action things that we can do so that we can use that restless energy constructively towards our goal. The to-do list with emotions is another one of my favorite techniques. We take that to-do list, which I'm sure everybody has, and we take it to the next level. So something I've noticed is that people who are high achievers tend to have one of two things happen with their to-do list. Either they are doing everything on their list, but they're feeling kind of like a hamster on a wheel. They're just not feeling a lot of connection. They're feeling kind of numb, like they're just going through the motions and they're looking for how they can get more connected and fulfilled as they knock out those tasks. Or they sometimes discover that they're hitting a wall and they're suddenly just stuck. It's like there's things that they're not getting done on their list and it's out of character for them, but they're just suddenly finding themselves procrastinating. 
So with the to-do list with emotions, what we do is we look at each item on the list and we notice what is the emotion that is associated with this activity, right? So maybe it's like running payroll. And for some people, they might say, oh, I just get this sinking feeling in my stomach because I hate numbers. And it just feels like this annoying task, right? Other people might look at it and they might say, I actually feel kind of honestly proud when I look at the fact that I'm running payroll and that I'm taking care of people, right? So whatever it is, by each item on your to-do list, you notice what are the emotions for you that come up. And if it's positive emotions, then we just make sure we pause and do that mindful recognition to make sure we're really maximizing the joy and the energy of what we're doing. And if it's a, you know, quote, negative or challenging emotion, then we think about a self-care plan, like saying, well, gee, if I'm struggling this much, if it's really bringing this big of a damper on my day to run payroll, is there somebody else I could delegate this task to? Another one that I think is fun for entrepreneurs and really for everybody that has a, an active mind um, is, is the idea of mind mapping. So what you're seeing here is a completed mind map. But what we do when we're making a mind map is we take one single idea, like in this case, the example here is, should I get an administrative degree, right? And we just put that one thing in the middle of the page, but I will say it could be anything, you know, whatever it is that just kind of gets you a little bit jumbled or mixed up inside and you'd like to really unpack and discover all of the mental pieces that you have around this issue and get an overview of them and then be able to think about them in a strategic way. So what we do with that uh, mind map here is we take the first thing and we say, we put it on the paper by itself, administrative degree. And then we say like, what are the first three or four things that come when I think of that goal or that idea? You know, maybe growing my personal network, getting some more income. And then what we do is we look at each one of those things that we wrote down and we do the same thing for them where we say, okay, well, when I think about more income, what are the first three things I think of? Or when I think about growing my network, what are the first things I think of for that? And for some people, it might even be, um, you know, anxiety because I'm not a people person or whatever it is. And then we can start to realize all of the pieces that connect with that original thing of getting an administrative degree. Um, and so it's almost like a deeper mindfulness exercise to take a deeper inventory of everything that's going on inside of your mind. Response prevention is another good one for me that I enjoy. Um, and as you can see here, it's a cell phone with a lock on it. You can do response prevention with many things, but cell phones tend to be one of the most popular. Um, the idea here is that in psychology, we have a stimulus and a response. And when we have certain things that maybe we're doing almost obsessively, like constantly checking our phone, for example, we start to realize that checking our phone is a response to a certain stimulus. And the stimulus might even be having open time in my day. Every time I have a single open moment, my response is to check my phone. And I'm starting to realize that maybe I'm overdoing it on that response. And I need to find ways to prevent myself from automatically going into that response. Because again, with entrepreneurs and intelligent driven people, we tend to have very tenacious minds. We kind of get something in our head and we can't let go of it. And that can be a very positive thing or it can actually become a vulnerability if we start getting you know, very tenacious and attached and aggressive about doing certain things and certain habits that are actually not serving us. So learning how to break certain types of behavioral habits like that response prevention technique can help with that. Another one, of course, that I love is the mental shortlist technique. So what we do with that one is when we have a cognitive habit that we've discovered, we're kind of always mentally pivoting onto this one certain topic. 
And it's maybe time to start moving on from that topic, but yet we feel stuck. We're ruminating, constantly always going back to this one topic. We give ourselves a new mental short list of things to think about instead. So for example, suppose that you had a meeting that didn't go very well and you just keep replaying that meeting in your mind. To a certain degree, believe it or not, that's helpful to kind of rewind the tape, look at it, understand it, think about what you can do differently, et cetera. But once you've done that and you're now just beating yourself up, just replaying it over and over again for no reason, that is the time to do the mental shortlist technique where what we do is we come up with five things that are going to be much better for us to think about instead and we pivot onto those things instead. I don't know if you guys have heard the saying, don't think about pink elephants before, but if I were to say to you, don't think about pink elephants, of course, the first thing that comes to your mind is pink elephants, right? So if there's a topic we don't wanna think about, we'll be much more successful in that if we come up with five things in advance that we know are going to be good, productive, interesting, enticing topics and then we pivot onto those things. We give ourselves a choice of a broad mental menu of five good things that we can think about instead. And it should be a, you know, a variety of things. Like it could be anything from your birthday and holiday shopping to dreaming up new product ideas or people that you've networked with in the past that you keep meaning to follow up with or employees that you keep meaning to send them a note of gratitude. Um, but the idea is that it, they should be written down because it sounds very simple when we're just sitting here calmly talking about the idea. But as we all know, when the thought monster strikes and you just feel like you have tunnel vision and you just keep going down this one path, it can actually be very helpful to have your new mental shortlist written out in advance. Um, thought replacement can be another very helpful technique when we have certain thoughts, you know, that, that we just keep going to, that maybe were helpful even at one time in our lives. And we just develop certain phrases that we always say to ourselves. And then we've come to realize that maybe those are not anymore, or perhaps they were never even such helpful phrases for us to say to ourselves. And it's not to necessarily have a judgment that any particular thought is always good or always bad. But when we recognize that there are certain thought patterns that we have almost automatically that are just not really serving us anymore, then with thought replacement, we learn how to start overriding those thoughts with new thoughts that are going to serve us better. And like I said, there might be times when it's just an old thought that wasn't even bad. It's just time to update it. But we also might have thoughts that we know are actually just bad, <laughs> like thoughts that are just actually just beating ourselves up. So you can use the thought replacement technique for those as well. Anchoring statements. This one tends to be best for people that are actually um, almost going into a panic mode, right? So um, for people that don't just get into a situation like with thought replacement needs where they're having thoughts that are not necessarily productive or helpful and they need to learn how to override them. People who get a little bit further into it to the point where they're not even having thoughts, like they're just having all out feelings of panic. Like when they're starting to get ready to go into a meeting, it's like their mind goes blank, their heart starts pounding, their palms start sweating. And they're not really having a lot of thoughts at all, except, you know, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm panicking and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I, I, I cannot survive this or something like that. In those situations, we need um, more anchoring statements, things, you know, just very simple, like my head is above my shoulders, my shoulders are above my hips, my hips are above my feet, right? Just things that are very simple, but that are simply designed to reconnect us with our gift of language so that we can start reconnecting with the verbal part of ourselves and then learning how to, how to take control of ourselves from that point on. So those are all of the techniques. I know all of you, um, whether you're on the call now or you're watching later, um, are just doing astounding <laughs> levels of quantities of things that you are doing in your day. So 
I'm so thankful that you all decided to take this time. I just want to share here as well my social media stuff in case you guys do want to connect with me there. And one little favor to ask you, if you do get the book and if you do like it or you know, even kind of based on some of the things that we covered here today, because this, this is all based on the book, I would really appreciate any reviews. Thank you so much, all of you. I just want to thank you again for the chance to connect and to share with you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Chloe. We had a really great time with you today. Hopefully you all um, learned some really good tips and tricks to help manage your anxiety, especially on this week where everything is so busy. Thank you all for joining us. Um, We hope to see you again. 